The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Hello and welcome to Postcards, our weekly look at the art, history, and cultural heritage of western Minnesota and beyond. Last week we began our look at the founding of Worthington. An influential name in that history is George Dayton, who went on to build the Dayton's department store empire. We continue now with part two of our story, produced by Ray Lowry. In 1889, George and Emma Dayton welcomed the fourth child into their family. So it was that the Daytons made plans for a new house, their third since coming to Worthington. But this would be no ordinary prairie house. George's new home would announce that the Daytons had truly arrived. George hired Sioux Falls architect Wallace Dow to design the house, and in June of 1890, work was begun. Mr. Dayton's new residence now displays its massive and elegant proportions. Though much has to be done before it is complete, it will be an ornament to the village and marks a new epoch in our village history where progress and prosperity is evinced in structures of elegance, taste, and comfort. Let others follow this line. Worthington Advance, July 24, 1890. Work progressed rapidly, and within four months, the spacious new home was completed. It was clear to all that the Dayton house was the new jewel of the growing prairie town, and it was hoped that other similar structures might follow. Few cities contain family residences more fitly adapted or more elegantly adorned than the new home of Mr. Dayton. The style of the building is up to the requirements of modern taste, the arrangement of the grounds and surroundings is appropriate, and the conveniences of the house are of the most perfect order and character. We welcome this latest acquisition to our town as one which will strike the eye of every newcomer favorably, an exhibition of social and financial progress and prosperity. This good example set, there will be more to follow. Worthington Advance, October 16, flush in small prairie towns such as Worthington, and most believed that their progress was inevitable. But the bubble was illusory, created in part by the Sherman Silver Act of 1890. The act required the United States government to purchase 4.5 million ounces of silver bullion every month from western silver mines. The bullion was paid for with notes that could be redeemed by the holders for silver or for gold. The act initially served its purpose of stimulating business throughout the West. But many Western silver mines were owned by European investors who soon began redeeming the treasury notes for gold. Capital began flowing out of the country, and in southwestern Minnesota, George Dayton was preparing to meet a crisis. The United States was then a great borrowing nation, and Europe began to feel we would pay our debts in silver. In the first half of 1891, over 70 million dollars in gold left us for England, and people who understood began to fear our government would be unable to maintain the gold standard. When Grover Cleveland became president in 1893, he found the treasury loaded with silver dollars and almost replete of gold. The booms were about at the busting point, and everything was ripe for a panic. George Dayton. 
panic hit when President Cleveland called for repeal of the Sherman Silver Act. Silver mines in the West closed, railroads went bankrupt, riots and strikes broke out, unemployment peaked at nearly 25 percent, and bank failures skyrocketed. The Panic of 1893 was the worst economic crisis the country had ever seen. Small towns were hit hard. Wheat dropped to 40 cents a bushel, oats to 10 cents, beef prices dropped to $10 a head, while sheep brought only a dollar. Railroads began refusing to accept bank checks for freight, demanding cash payments instead. Farmers went broke, farm mortgages went unpaid, and small town banks tottered on the abyss. On July 5, 1893, the Nobles County Bank closed its doors. This caused a run on the Bank of Worthington located just across the street. It had been a practice for the Bank of Worthington to close from 12 o'clock until 1 o'clock for lunch every day. But George ordered the bank to remain open to dispel rumors of failure. The Bank of Worthington weathered a three-day run on its deposits, but just barely. George pulled through the crisis, partly on faith, partly by calling in every favor owed to him. He later recalled, One woman drew out a considerable sum. I went to her home about 6 o'clock and said, There's no time to talk. You don't need that money, and I do. The husband at once said to the wife, Go upstairs and get that money for Mr. Dayton. Bank runs were commonplace and banks were closing everywhere. But in Worthington, those who had withdrawn funds from the Bank of Worthington returned to the teller windows to redeposit those funds with confidence. The wife of the president of the failed Nobles County Bank even showed up to deposit several hundred dollars in $20 gold pieces she had been wise enough not to place in her husband's bank. The Bank of Worthington survived the crisis and the town survived as well. On December 7, 1893, the Worthington Advance was able to report, the trees left standing after a cyclone are considered good timber. The Bank of Worthington is good timber. In the midst of the bank crisis, George Dayton was faced with a personal crisis. He had long been encouraged to balance his rural land holdings with urban land holdings. In 1892, he had purchased a parcel of land on Nicola Avenue on what was then the edge of downtown Minneapolis. While the bank crisis of 1893 swirled about him, George had to decide whether he would cancel or continue with the $260,000 eight-story building then under construction on the 600 block of Nicollet Avenue. He elected to continue with the project. The building was known as the Dayton Medical Arts Building and provided doctors with a state-of-the-art location to practice medicine. The building was universally recognized as a positive contribution to the city of Minneapolis. Several years later, when the First Presbyterian Church on the 700 block of Nicola Avenue burned down, George Dayton of Worthington, Minnesota, was the man to whom the city turned to redevelop the property. Dayton constructed a modern department store on the site. George Dayton rented the property to tenants, but in 1902, the Dayton family moved to Minneapolis, and George took over the operation of Goodfellows, later renamed Dayton's Dry Goods, and then simply Dayton's. The rest is part of Minnesota history. The Daytons must have loved the Worthington home because they built one almost identical to it in Minneapolis, a home enjoyed by several generations of the family.
back in Worthington, George sold the Dayton house to one of his business associates, Charles Smallwood. Smallwood, operator of Worthington's first telephone exchange, lived in the house with his wife Florence and their two children until his death in 1908. Florence lived there until she passed away in 1921. Charles and Florence's daughter Mary Smallwood and her husband, State Senator Jack Cashel, took possession of the house and lived together in the home until 1931, when Mary died at the young age of 43. Jack remarried Ruth Burtz in 1933, and the couple lived together in the home for five years, producing three children. As in the days of the Daytons and the Smallwoods, the house remained a center of elegance and social activity. But in 1938, Jack died. Ruth was left with an immense house and young children to care for. In order to make ends meet, Ruth converted the home into a boarding house. In time, the home developed into what was then known as a rest home, a boarding house catering specifically to the elderly. In the 1960s, an institutional wing was added to the West End to accommodate the needs of a more modern nursing home. But in the 1980s, state requirements governing nursing home care made the facility unsuitable the Cashels closed what had become known as the Cashel Home. In October of 2002, the Dayton House was purchased for $150,000 by Historic Worthington, a nonprofit group dedicated to the restoration and preservation of historically significant buildings in Worthington, Minnesota. Their mission is to make these structures accessible as public gathering places and to interpret the community's cultural and social history through these buildings' residents. The Dayton House was chosen because of its ties to the Dayton department store chain, its connection to a prominent Midwestern architect, and its ownership by a dynamic man who recognized Worthington's potential early on. Had George Dayton not been around to shepherd Worthington through the aftermath of the winter of 1880 to 81 and the financial panic of 1893, Worthington may have faded from existence like so many other prairie towns. At the same time, the lessons Dayton learned in Worthington undoubtedly helped shape his business character and contributed to his subsequent success. The story of the Dayton's department store chain, after all, is the story of small town values writ large. Before restoration of the Dayton House was begun, a historic report was completed by River Architects along with a team of conservators and other professionals. Artie was planning an intense restoration work by a dedicated team of volunteers and professionals followed. Great care was taken in the selection of wallpaper, drapes, and furnishings. The home was eventually restored to its 1890 elegance. Today, the restored house is used as a gathering place for receptions, weddings, meetings, parties, and other social events. Additionally, there are two bed and breakfast suites available on the second floor for overnight guests. In December of 2003, the historic Dayton House was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. In 2004, it received one of the Minnesota Preservation Alliance Preservation Awards. The two-year restoration cost was approximately $2 million, much of this money donated by the Target Foundation. 
Other Dayton family members, likewise, donated money to assist with the restoration. Bruce and Ruth Dayton were particularly generous with monetary gifts, donation of art pieces for the home, and the passionate personal support they gave the project from beginning to end. Scores of individuals generously gave their time, talents, expertise, and monetary gifts in the restoration of the historic Dayton House. Let it be said that a little piece of each of them dwells within the walls of this home. Special thanks for that report go to Okabina Media and producer Ray Lowry. From history to cutting edge art, we introduce you to Jess Larson, an artist and teacher who takes old items and creates new ideas. I'm going to see completely different versions of what everybody... I love working with students. I can't believe I was so lucky to find this job uh, for myself so quickly in life that I can't imagine doing anything else. They are the most interesting people I will ever meet every group that comes through and I learn so much from them. Besides creating in the classroom teaching her students at the University of Minnesota Morris, Jess Larson has been on a creative role regarding her own personal art. Over the past four years she has created an amazing array of related pieces and each of them using technology both old and new. A computer, a computer printer, ink, and needle and thread. This particular series is about that kind of language attached to some to a woman that you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. If you're if you're too passive, then people are critical about you not standing up for yourself and you're not taking advantage of the things that you need to do to be a modern woman. And then if you are gutsy and you are pushy, about it, you get slammed because you are being, um, you're stepping outside of what you're supposed to be as, as a woman in society. And I'm not saying this is the way that it is for everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm working with the extremes to kind of highlight it in the middle. Jess Larson's needlework so pokes fun at off. female yeah. place in Western <laughs> society. Each panel contains a stereotyped image of an item associated with women in society, like these high-heeled shoes, and then combines it with a carefully chosen word. And then I, then I start thinking about, okay, what can I say that would insult the shoe? What is, what is about it that could be an insult, either as something passive or something aggressive? And I start taking kind of notes on it. And I decided the shoe was probably going to be a little bit more aggressive, especially a red high heel that's all pointy and stuff. It kind of implies like maybe a power woman, a corporate person. She gets most of her ideas from old magazines and by attending garage sales. I'm more attracted to the old objects because it's just because I kind of like that stuff personally. And I think a student or, or a young person looking at this work will feel a little bit safe to be um, to kind of follow along that critical um, th thought process if it's not directly at them. Like I'll never make one about an iPod, for example. I don't have anything attached to it. The same themes still exist. The same inequities are still there. And especially if you pay attention to the language being used for a lot of women who are moving into higher levels of power and leadership, it, it's it's really kind of scary and blatant, so that's what the work is about. Not lost is the irony of Jess Larson's work, describing the place of women from a sewing machine, with painstaking attention paid to detail. She's figured out a way to layer threads in the embroidery process, creating a physical depth to each piece. Computer software in the sewing machine helps direct her design. Now they're, they're beautiful and the, and the embroideries actually get to be almost thick like cardboard, which isn't what you're supposed to do with this machine and this, and this stuff. I, I think I drove the people nuts that I bought the machine from for the first year that I was showing up with things saying, well this is happening, isn't that weird? And they always said to me, you're not supposed to do that with the machine. And I'd say, but I did. And they go, 
Oh, okay. And because you're not supposed to do 80, 90 color changes, apparently. Thinking about old things in new ways. Like, I think I've been working with the same themes for more than 20 years, that they bubbled up as a student and I've, I've continued them. And I think the thing that I find interesting is that every time I finish a project, I have more questions. And that, that to me is a sign that I'm doing well, that every, every item begets five to six more questions that I can use to move on to the next set. Uh, my mom sews, I know people who knit, so, and then there's cooks. So it's like these things that women do were the things that distinguished them. And you could see them as oppressive, but I saw them as their, the things that they did that made them special and a way that they showed affection to other people to make somebody a pie, their special pie, is almost as good as a hug in a way that they, they put all this energy into it to make this thing. And to get a handmade object for somebody is, is really special. Jess Larson says the culture of her native western Minnesota provides the creative spark for all of her projects. Uh, leaving Minnesota was the easiest way to figure out all the things that made me who I am. When I went to graduate school in Colorado that I, I figured out really quickly the, the Minnesota port, parts of myself that make, that make me kind of who I am and my family. I, I, live in a, I live in an area where I can still see my family, my extended family. My dad was one of 12 kids. I have 40 plus cousins on one side of the family and my mom's side's a little smaller but I saw those people. Um, I've, I saw my grandmother weekly and almost every day up until she died a few years ago at age 91. So I think, I think again in a society where people move all over the country, I, I may, I'm making work that is so much about being linked to a sense of one's personal history. And, and I think it's, it's a history that a lot of people don't always want to explore. It seems sort of mundane, but it was really important to me as a child. I learned a lot of the things that I know how to do by sitting at the kitchen table and watching grandmothers do the various things they do, from making bread to making something else or just handling their daily lives. They were my first feminist models. They never self-proclaimed as feminist models, but I saw them as the most powerful and interesting people I had ever met. And while serious about her work, Jess Larson hopes people will see the lighter side of it too. I hope they laugh a little bit. And, and I hope it's a laugh that they give themselves into first and giggle about it, but on the back side, comes in this little thought of like, oh, oh, that's what she meant. So I like, I like humor that kind of is this entry point for a little bit something more serious. So there's a twist in it. Finally, a celebration of culture. For that, we head to Southwest Minnesota State University in Marshall, where one student's dream of raising awareness of his African heritage led to a campus-wide event. Doing a dance that was choreographed by Edith Danza. She's on our team. Um, it's a Malawian dance. So that should be fun. And then we're doing stepping as well, which is what we normally do in the team itself. I'm very good with you guys. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a great night. Oh, boy. Never mind. We're good. We're good. We're good. Okay. Am I nervous? Uh, it's good to be nervous, you know? Yeah. They have to follow in order. It's exciting. It's nerve-wracking. I mean, and they're kind of running late. Everything going on and off. You guys rehearsed? Oh, oh I need to do one more thing. Tonight is the first inaugural African night at Southwest Minnesota State University. Right. Let's get it on. Showtime. It's going to be different um, performances from West Africa and East Africa. There are going to be performers coming from the cities to perform different kind of dances. And there will be also people at the university performing as well. It's just something new to the campus, something different, something they've never seen before, and a taste of Africa. But it's good. It's good exposure for the school, and it's something different to Marshall, Minnesota. My name is Raven Knight. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, woo woo, Windy City. African Night is special to me because it's something new to the school. <laughs> the 
them showing us their culture from East Africa, West Africa, South Africa. It just shows us a different thing. It's because coming from a different place in Africa, they do like different dances and different body movements. Some move more of the hips. Some do more of the chest popping. Others do feet motion, so it's just showing us different types of dances. That's how I actually met people, was joining the team and getting to know people. Then from there, I met their friends, and they became my friends. So it was just a good learning experience, and, you know, I learned how to step and things like that. So it was pretty nice. <laughs> this next dance is representing my home country, Malawi. And most people, when you first tell them I'm from Malawi, look at me like, where? So it's in um, Southeast Africa, and it's around Zambia, Mozambique. Yeah. The song is basically, it's a wedding song, and the people are just happy. The difference between Marshall and Chicago, um, I mean, what a start. <laughs> Marshall, Minnesota, I mean, there's about 65 African students. Then there's an African American student, then there is the refugees, immigrants, then and we wanted they always wanted to do this, but it was never done. So and I'm a very uh, optimistic guy, so I figured it'll be it'll be nice, you know, to have the show. So <laughs> Because Marshall is like is not diverse at all. So like Bringing the school here, then you have people coming from Nepalese and different places in Africa. You have Asia, things like that. So, I don't know. It just it just helps open other people's eyes to different cultures. I mean, I was born in Ethiopia. You know, I came into the U.S. when I was nine in '97. But then I got then I got to the American culture. Basically, I went to the elementary, junior high, high school. You know, I've been following basically the Westernized system. And I said, and I appreciate that, you know, because um, yeah, it's helped me out a long way. But when I got to college, you know, so that's when I kind of started looking at the back, back of my, you know, my heritage, my tribe, such and such. And through oral history, I, you know, I belong to the Oromo ethnic group. I think it's awesome. Well, I think it's great that more schools are starting to to explore the diversity of the world and kind of you know get out there, especially in Marshall, Minnesota, where it's you know farmland and and farmers, and that's about as far as the diversity goes. It's special. It's the first one, so hopefully it could go on for a long time. It's good to be a part of the first one. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008.